This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, I'm back. It is now Friday and we had a special event. The first of the month happened between the last episode and this one, which means we have 56 new campaigns when we'd normally have like 20-ish <laughs> to go. So, uh, so that's quite a significant amount of, of jump there uh, into summer. I honestly would say that it would be better if they did it October 1st, because if you get paid every other Friday, like I do, that means in October, typically you're going to have three pay periods and probably be a little looser with the cash. But, you know, maybe you're also planning to spend it all on Halloween. Who knows how they do the calculation. Anyway, I saw Shang-Chi and I thought it was pretty cool. Except I tried to watch it in 3D and they asked the, or they gave a ticket for 3D to the one person that had to do all the 3D testing and uh, for the home releases back when they actually made discs in America for that. And so I look at it and I'm like, this is not in 3D. And I get up and raise hell and everything. They're like, I paid extra for this. And uh, so I got to see it for free. So somebody screwed up and I can't complain about seeing it for free. So that part's fine. Um, it's an okay movie. I think Black Panther was a little better. But, uh, you know, the team is working hard there at Marvel. I would say it's uh, a good start for a new character. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, go see it. Wait 45 days, see it at home. Whatever works for you. But uh, that's all I got for pop culture right now. And we'll get started on the hour-ish episode that this is going to be to get through 56 campaigns. If you can, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And uh, if you got any comments, you know, you can throw those in. Those are uh, always fun to read. Well, not always, but most of the time. You guys are usually pretty good. I would say every once in a while there's like a straggler that does something really weird. But for the most part, you guys are really great. First up, we have Green Hell the Board Game. I'm not sure if this is based on one of the movies that's named Green Hell. Um, but it is about adventures in the jungles where terrible, terrible things can happen. Uh, it does have a solo mode, so that part's cool. Um, I would say, you know, if you're a fan of the Vietnam War, uh, I think that would probably be akin to what's going on here. Um, uh, maybe Heart of Darkness, uh, would be another thing if you read that book. Uh, that's from the... 1800 so if you update it to apocalypse now that kind of thing just type of weird jungle ish adventures game wise what would be the thing that's closest to it maybe seventh continent it's just it's a very different presentation than seventh continent but you're still kind of going through the mysteries of a jungle and building things as you can see there with the crafting and it's kind of neat that they give you this um i don't know it looks like a booby trap a uh, type of uh, dice tower, which is kind of neat. You can see the pachinko aspect of it all. So that part is cool. Um, as far as the characters, they don't seem to have much unique presentation to them. Uh, and I would prefer something more like Predator, where like everybody was their own superhero and everybody like stood out in a certain way uh, when you're out there facing through the jungle. But those are just, I'm sure, dumb aesthetics. Uh, you got the Gilligan's Island <laughs> aspects of building everything out of coconuts and bananas. But, uh, you know, I'm sure you can get a lot more deadly with the things that you're making. Turtle shells is a good innovation and a thing to add. Um, yeah, so if you can dig being out there in the jungles, you're watching Naked and Afraid or Platoon or whatever else it is that you're be checking out, then uh, maybe this will be the type of game for you. It doesn't have the deadliness of a predator which i would hope for in this type of game but it does have some creepy stuff going on and then we have something that is far more minimalist this is five moods ahead two player game uh so it's a print and play simple kind of thing as you can see john h cone has made 53 others and backs a ton of these tiny little games 500 or almost 500 of them so uh, obviously he's uh, out there supporting folks five bucks for the print and play copy um it is a simple grid system and you're going to use the moves uh to try to finish the game uh, i don't really know how else to describe it um the way that it is described itself is i think it's like a almost like a sim 
uh, city kind of situation. So it looks like from what it says, like under occupation or maybe there's a... Uh... Oh, no, no, no. That's a prior campaign. You can get that as a bonus offer. So I'm not really sure like the story behind the game, but it looks like there's some type of movement. And then you plan out the limited number of moves uh, and that somehow gets you between the, the points that you need to go to. So, I mean, these type of puzzles can be a lot of fun. Maybe you're trying to just avoid each other. But it's cheap strategy game. I mean, you can't really go wrong. Give them a couple bucks for the idea and then print it off for a few cents. Then we have a classic argument. Who would win in a fight? So who would win is a game of debate about putting people in improbable contests. I think that this is great for nerds who like to argue. And you may be one of those people. You may be no one of those people. Um, so I guess you get certain skills with these cards. Uh, hairdressing, swimming, and sword swallowing would be skills. And then maybe you could use those to fight against somebody else. Um, that's one way to do it. Otherwise, I guess you would just take a bunch of pop culture icons and just see if they'd fight each other. But I think that game Super Fight maybe already does that. Uh, it's an interesting idea. I like puzzles. If you've been following this channel long enough, I like puzzles where we just take a bunch of random things and then try to solve a random problem. And that seems like it would fit right there. Uh, the problem is... I already have a bunch of ways of doing that, so I don't necessarily need this game. But if you don't already have it, then maybe it would be fun for you. Then we have a game that looks really familiar. Broadside Empires of Steel Hunting Grounds Digital Edition. Um, so this I've seen before with these like printouts of the, of the sea and then the metal or plastic or 3D printed boats that have come off. The... Um, I don't know, it looks like saffron to me, but the, the fire and the smoke, I don't know if that's cotton that's been spray pa painted or something, that really looks familiar. So I think maybe this has come up before. Navy of the Russian Empire, maybe that part is new. Um, you get all different types of ships to go along with it. Uh, these are all 3D printed from the look of it. And yeah, so they're adding more stuff uh, that goes with it. Naval combat is popular we've had a couple of campaigns i think last week or maybe on tuesday um they happen all the different times like all the way back to u-boat where you got the full submarine to yourself they always find some cool innovative way to represent the boats um by being on the surface you don't really have to at manage the 3d-ness of the air combat or um like the the submarine combat so it makes it easy for it to be on a tabletop um, so there's, uh, lots of cool things that, that can be done, even though they do have some air abilities, uh, these are not the types of things that would be going to extreme altitudes. So you can just kind of like do what they're doing here. I like the little bridge system where it would just go over the boats. So yeah, you know, looks like it'd be a lot of fun. It'd be fun to watch what people are doing with it and, uh, components look cool. And I'm pretty sure this has been around once or twice. It says three created. So that might be one or two of the same campaign that's happened before. Let's see. Yeah. So this has been through a couple different times. Adding different uh, abilities or ships or different things to go with it. I don't know. It looks cool. And I think at a minimum, if you really wanted to, you could add these to uh, whatever game you're currently playing. Because... They just look cool, and you can do whatever you want with them. Then we have Bunny Brawl, which is reminiscent to me. I don't know if you played the game's Worms uh, from, what is it, like Team 17, the developer. That's what this reminds me of, because this is supposed to be where cute meets chaos. And you have bunnies going to war with machine guns and special powers and all this kind of stuff, but also supposed to look cute. And that, to me, feels like Worms. Um, you are going to make a, it says to assemble your kill squad. So I guess you're going to be drafting each other, um, and trying to figure out, uh, each other's weaknesses and going on from there. Uh, you have bunnies, holes, targets, and brawls. So maybe this is 
a uh, Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny kind of situation. Just happens to be between several different types of bunnies. And uh, they compete. That could be it. So I would say if you've been playing Exploding Kittens, because this has a not safe, safe for work edition to go as well, then uh, maybe this would be one of those uh, types of games that you can pick up as well. Uh, obviously not made by Matt Inman, who does the oatmeal and all that other kind of stuff. It's uh, more of a Looney Tunes meets anime kind of uh, aesthetic. But uh, if you're in that camp of wanting something cute, but a little on the adult side as well, then maybe this will be a fun competitive game for your group. Then we have another one of these trading card games, Conflict of Dreams. We keep seeing them pop out. They keep having really high expectations for their goals. And uh, I've said it before, um, it is really difficult to be in this space. You have basically as... Uh, uh, you know, the, the space is saturated with Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, all the other stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, if you want this one that looks like it's got a little more steampunk involved in it, um, different characters, asymmetric, uh, you know, attacking of each other, but it just feels like it's more of that same feel, maybe just... Uh, a bit more focused on a particular hero or commander uh, than what Magic the Gathering could offer. It comes with pre-made decks, which is a great way to start um, the system and have everything be its own deal. It's just anything that's some type of like trading or collectible card game, I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. It seems like if you could find two really happy people to play with, you'd be lucky. Then we have uh, Dice Lords, which is similar, I guess, to the same types of uh, criticisms and having it be a collectible trading game. But this time it does it with Dice, which sets it in an entirely different niche and in an entirely different uh, grouping. So whereas the card world is so over bloated with uh, clones of Magic the Gathering, uh, there's only a few collectible dice games that are out there. They cost more because of the plastics and things like that. So there's just not as many. Um, but there are people that like to collect dice. There are people that love dice games. Um, what's the one with the, the potion explosion? And um, there was another one. Oh, I'm trying to think of it. It made so much money, but it was all just like a dice collection game about building monsters. That stuff makes a ton of money. So if this is a little bit different type of combat system where you're not using units other than the dice, then this might work uh, for a lot of folks that are already doing that because it's just one more component <laughs> they've customized to make it work. And uh, you don't really need much else, I think, other than a symbol, uh, a stand-in for the type of uh, monster that you want to be. Keep losing it there. And depending on the dice itself, you get different attacks. As you can see, like this blue one happens to be the wyvern. So it would have its own uh, stuff. And the animated skeleton uh, would have different types of attacks. Uh, obviously, you have like a one in three chance with the animated uh, skeleton uh, for a certain effect. And that flips over with the wyvern. So um, you can customize things pretty well. There's games that are... Uh, in the miniature space, like all of the IDW games, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles ones, work in a very similar way, but they just happen to include minis. But they all have customized dice for each character. So uh, I, I see this as the, a type of game that could work very effectively. It just has to be something that grabs your cool factor. And then this is another problematic type of game in that it is uh, sexual in nature for adults, and they always require extravagantly high uh, entry points but the market for it is very small this is something that would do really well at a bachelorette party this is something that would do really well at uh, an adult bookstore but not so well on kickstarter it's just not something that you would normally go to kickstarter for i like the idea of this being a little more on the kinky side Whereas um, most of the ones we see here are trying to be a little bit too lovey-dovey, uh, which would take 
the game the game would take the romance out of it rather than put it in whereas if you're already in that kink lifestyle or you're already uh ready to go for this kind of um uh concept or this type of fun with your partner or partners or whatever the case may be uh randomizing it in a game function may actually be something that turns you on so uh that part's fine um the name is a good pun you got 170 different uh, playing cards, but only 30 of them are X-rated. So I was like, that's kind of a waste. Um, it looks like you get... Uh, um, oh, so you get uh, things, some level of consent between green, yellow, and red. So uh, that's a good way to practice the idea of consent. So maybe that's like uh, a good starter BDSM relationship kind of deal your uh your partner just read 50 shades of gray and doesn't know where to get going so maybe they pick up punishment and then you just test a few things out maybe that works and i think that works a lot better than a lot of the other pieces or things games tools that we've seen in the past that were really for like counseling sessions <laughs> and this might be more of a fun game and then we have FYPM the game, which is something that might be hard to describe as the acronym doesn't really mean anything. Uh, so I think maybe they should have just used the whole word here. Instead of find your soulmate, it's find your 18 plus mate or find your porn mate. Not really sure uh, what the case is, but um, it's made to find a common point between everybody that's been on lockdown and the the adult websites out there have seen more traffic than they've ever seen ever from people being bored. Um, so I think there is a lot of room for comedy in a game that somehow pokes fun at that. And um, you have to admit to certain things that you do or don't like according to these cards. So it's a question and answer system. If you have a good group of people that is not um, prudish to the point of if you were to open up a little bit about your life or your likes or dislikes, then uh, hopefully, you know, if they're going to sit there and, and cause you problems or they're, they're just going to act weird, I wouldn't play this with coworkers. Uh, but if just whatever friends and things, couples, then maybe it would be okay. Uh, it could also ruin some relationships, like a lot of these games. Um, but it could be fun. I would say the younger you are, 18 to 22, would probably be the key demographic for this. Or bachelor parties, or like bachelorette parties even might be fun. Um, whoever you feel the most comfortable around and don't feel like you're going to be judged by, if you can get that kind of group, then... You might find some fascinating things out about uh, the world itself. So, you know, it could be fun, but be careful. Be careful in, in who you talk to or talk about, especially if it's a, a chatty Cathy type of person that is going to put your business out everywhere. Um, then you don't want to play this with them because this should be something that follows bachelor party rules where you keep it inside the uh, the you know, the, the circle of trust. And then we have a magnetic game organizer, which is a great idea to have, but this is the worst time to come out with it because Hexy Time from uh, the folks at Wormwood, they've been promoting the hell out of it for a long time. And there are a couple hundred thousand dollars in now. Uh, these are plastic magnetic pieces, whereas the Hexy Time ones are all wood. Maybe there's some people if they're thinking about it at the same time. Um, but while you have the other group going, I think they're going to be cannibalizing some of your 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 business. Um, there's not as many types of tiles here as is what's represented from Wormwood. And most of the things that you would need are here. And that part's great. Um, I just think that uh, as a business decision... They would make more money if they separated themselves out by a couple of months and said, hey, you know, if you didn't want the wood version, if you didn't want to pay extra for the wood version at $20 a piece, 
then um, here you go, you could get these pieces. Uh, so it's saying it's magnetic, but it's also offering these um, six hex designs for only 20 bucks, which is the cost of one single uh, of the cheapest tiles from Wormwood, which makes this a great option. However, it doesn't come with magnets, so it's hard to be magnetic when that happens. Um, you can get a five pack for less money than the uh, the Wormwood ones, but the shipping isn't necessarily better. So there's options. They do most of the same things. There are some specialized dials and, and uh, other types of things that are part of the comparison um, that you can get here for cheaper. Does plastic look as good as wood? Does it smell as good? Does it feel as good? Does it have the same weight and heft and all that kind of stuff? Those are all subjective questions. So uh, I would paint these because they're gray and uh, paint them, I don't know, metallic or something. But uh, they are going to be useful. You can get them many, many more of these. So as it shows here, like a whole Catan board would be uh, almost 150 bucks by the time you shipped it. Um, as opposed to single hundred dollar racks for one D and D character being over 150 bucks. Um, I think it's okay, but like I said, separating the time between this launch and the, the, the mega attention launch, um, I think would have been a better business move. Uh, product wise, I think if you looked at the Wormwood stuff and said, oh, it's too much money, um, you might look at these or you might not just because it's so you've already been deflated by uh, the cost of this other piece. Hard to say what people are thinking because this isn't even the only competitor in this exact space. Uh, but I think it's probably the best competitor so far uh, because it's it competing at a good price and it allows you to 3D print out as many as you need for a low price as well. So things to think about. Then we have, uh, they were taking major risk on this and I'm glad they were able to pull it off. Uh, Limbo Eternal War 1.5, this being 1.5, when you put a $130,000 price tag on something, then you have an idea of how much it's already gonna make, then that's okay. Uh, the minis on this is the selling point. Uh, I'm sure the game is great. It's a skirmish game. You can play solo if you want. There's all those good things that are part of it. Uh, but it's got some badass minis. Everybody loves minis. That is paying the hundred plus dollars for uh, the plastic pieces on these. Um, they all look pretty special. There's a lot of unique troops. And, you know, you have that uh, anachronistic demon. Looks like there's possibly some not just armor but some tech uh, kind of thrown in as well um, these would look fantastic in certain uh, other skirmish games if you have other skirmish games that you want to attach to it the ladies there would make some great uh, dioramas and paint jobs so if you've played the limbo before if you have a desire to play games that have uh, seven deadly sins as part of uh, the storytelling and as part of the the war against the people uh, looks like they also have um, what is this the saga of Noah Dean which looks like it's Norse related uh, Ilva I think actually means wolf um, and Odun instead of Odin shield maidens all Viking ish stuff which is a popular subgroup uh, and genre for games and all that kind of things um, I expect this to have a significant amount of these uh, stretch goals unlocked. But it's minis on a board, skirmish battle uh, type of system. And that is a, a popular genre for a lot of people. And um, something that's easily relatable to have that apocalyptic end of the world battle. The thing that would happen at uh, the moment of Ragnarok or Revelations. So, uh, yeah. I mean... It's easy to understand the storytelling. It's easy to find the story in the miniatures themselves. Some great sculpts. And it's a game that has 
a built-in audience, so it's an updated version to that. Uh, I think those are all winning combinations. Then we have something interesting, Raptor Island the card game. So two to five player game where you're looking for dinosaur DNA from a helicopter, I think. Uh, maybe this is like running through the Savage Land in the X-Men comics with the, you know, some type of dart gun. <laughs> maybe that's how it works. It's interesting artwork. Uh, the thing about dinosaurs now, there is so much going on in the paleontology world. It is changing weekly. Some dinosaurs you thought were settled. Turns out they exist. With, there's evidence to show that they exist in entirely different biomes or uh, having entirely different behavior. And feathers is a thing now. That wasn't when we were uh, reading the books about these in the 80s and before. Um, even in the 90s when Jurassic Park came out. Uh, had that information been around, I'm sure they would have been covered in feathers. So that style and that look is what they're going for here in this art. Uh, so it's got that more traditional uh, kind of appeal. Uh, you got close-ups of the T-Rex. And it depends. At this point... When you're looking at pictures of dinosaurs, do you want the classic look or do you want the updated new stuff? So that's a thing to think about. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they will hit their mark. Uh, it's good for them to be almost there already. So they should start getting into stretch goals probably within the next week or so. And I would hope that everybody could find whatever of these 56 cards happens to be closest to their favorite dinosaur animal. It feels like there's a lot of Jurassic Park already thrown into it. Um, it says they want to be inspired by Godzilla, Dinotopia, King Kong, and Jurassic Park. So maybe there's some Skull Island uh, stuff thrown in there as well. Uh, I would check it out. If you're a big fan of dinosaurs, maybe it'll work for you. If you're a huge fan of paleontology, though, it might be not current enough uh, on the depiction. Then we have a drinking game, Spirited the Game, or the Spirited Game. Um, yeah, it's just one of the, another one of those deals where, uh, do you really need a game? <laughs> or can you just hang out and look at each other and tell stories and, and enjoy the beverages, and be at the bar or wherever it is that you're drinking? Um, those are questions you got to ask yourself. Uh, there are little challenges on each one of those squares. Um, it's a, one of those things where... You really got to be careful, though, how much it keeps saying, like, oh, you, everybody drinks. What are you drinking? Maybe it's too much. Keep track of it. Three to ten players, so hopefully you're not drinking alone. Um, I would love to see one of these drinking games that has stuff to do for the designated drivers. That would be fun, too. But that's not this game. Uh, again, drinking games, if you're 21 to 23... In the United States, for our culture, maybe it's different in Germany. Maybe they're a bit more fun. I think Europeans in general are better at having fun. Uh, maybe they know what to do with it and go from there. But uh, here, you know, we do things that it's just cheap with flip cup, beer pong, that kind of stuff seems to be as far as it gets. Then we have Don't Turn Off the Lights, which is maybe for the Monsters, Inc. fans. I do not watch that much Disney, so I haven't seen Monsters, Inc., so I'm just guessing at that. I did see Little Monsters with Fred Savage, though, and uh, Howie Mandel, so I'm going to throw this out as maybe being a Little Monsters related to, uh, like, the things that are under the bed. Uh, these guys, though, are trying to steal your soul, so maybe a kid version of Freddy Krueger <laughs> could be. Uh, magnetic closing uh, box, so that's a nice upgrade to have to be able to throw it all together in there. Um, if it's me, I might take a little bit of uh, glow in the dark powders and throw it on the box uh, just to make it look like a night light type of thing to go with it. Um, and I guess you compete with the monsters for the souls or against the monsters to keep your soul. Either one. Sounds like an interesting way to go. Howard the Duck's evil twin up there in the upper right. Uh, so some of the monsters I can tell like what they are or what they're supposed to be. Other ones are a little too stylized for me to figure out. and might have just too many f uh, features. Um, it's like when a kid tells you like like everything, every word that they know when you try to make a monster. Or you try to draw the monster they're thinking of. 
it's a little bit like that kind of descriptions uh, on some of these faces. Or uh, kids' version of Kingdom Death, like like uh, like an infant's version of uh, of Kingdom Death monsters. Maybe that's the the appeal that they're going for. There's nothing wrong with it. Just an aesthetic choice. Um, but you know, it might be a little too scary saying, you know, these are just monsters out to chill, kill, take children's souls, so maybe keep it for the adults. Here's a really interesting concept, Earthen War, two-player fantasy board game where you control a golem in World War I. Um, that's interesting. Uh, the, I'm a little disappointed in the bust here because of how cool it looks when it's all standing there, like that, what the golem would actually look like. It just kind of looks half fast looks half completed uh when it's there uh, in the bust form so like something that's just half made out of play-doh you know what i mean i'm sure they worked really hard on it and they got the little runes and and other stuff in it but it's just not complete enough to be uh in such a small form for me so i might go get a different uh uh monster or a different uh design in order to be the golem i might like even yeah so they say it's too cute but i like might like that cute one better just because it looks more complete um so like even these ones here that look like their mid their early prototypes look like they're more complete they look more like what's going on here if i were to pick up this box i didn't mean to click on that but if I were to pick up this box and I expected to see that in here and I saw this piece like I'm seeing now, it's a little disappointing. So the game might be cool and all, but I'm supposed to be talking to you about things that will get you to buy it, but also that will make you happy or might, what might you might be disappointed by. Stuff to think about. If the game's good, I've got plenty of earth elementals uh, in various uh, states. <laughs> Uh, of, uh, uh, you know, from uh, Reaper or from D&D stuff or other games that I'd use instead. And that's probably the case. So not really much of a selling point. The story here looks like it would be the selling point uh, for me anyway. Uh, unless I was making playing a sculpting game, we were, we were going to complete half-sculpted things. Uh, yeah. I mean, these other folks are saying that they like it with the ceramic golems, whoever board game review is. Uh, but I don't know. I, I look at such beautiful sculpts dozens of times a week <laughs> that it's kind of like, eh, you know, for me anyway. For you, I would say whatever floats your boat, you do enjoy yourself. Um, I would give the game a shot for sure. If I had someone else to play with on my own, uh, maybe somebody that is really into Jewish folklore, because that's where the golem comes from, uh, might find this especially interesting. Um, or a big Clayface fan from Batman, maybe. That would be an interesting, uh, an interesting way to go. World War I fans, I don't know, it might be too fantasy uh, for them, but it's, uh, it, it looks otherwise the board and all the other kind of stuff look kind of neat. I don't know. I could have gone with this whole art aesthetic style here uh, of this lady for the whole game, and that would have worked for me. Then we have Schwabble Nobble. Schnobble Wobble? Something. The most excellent acting game in the galaxy. Is this charades? Could be. Hard to tell, though, because that's what you get. If I click on this, I'm clicking on this. Nothing. Which means... There's absolutely no description to anyone that wants to buy this of what this game is. That's why nobody's bought, you know, backing it. It's great. Help us build this game. Help us build what game? Give me something. Give me an idea where you're going at with it. It's got to be visual or you've already lost me because 10 to 15 seconds is all you get before someone decides to not buy your product and move on. We have a new entrant in a genre that's popped up a few times, but it doesn't seem to be oversaturated. There seems to be 
uh, an audience for it. 3D printed uh, board games for t like tactics style. So if you played Final Fantasy Tactics, it fits in that grouping. Um, this one, Tactics Royal Fantasy. So it's got a lot of those names that go together. You stack up the hedges and water or whatever the thing is and you build your board and that sets your elevation and your different uh, movements. 200 pieces seems to let you build quite a uh, uh, you know good board setup and uh, you have enough components for two to four players. Resin cast though, I get it if they, they needed to do it that way, but I'd prefer plastic. Uh, and these are 3D printed. If they could be injection molded, it'd be a lot cheaper for them, but I understand that you know, injection molding can be kind of a pain. Um, so it looks like they would be good though. Uh, I don't see anything that would be ruined by having a 3D printed part. So maybe they just happen to have a bunch of uh, resin printers or uh, other systems, some Prusa printers or whatever that's sitting around and uh, that'll allow them to make all the pieces with only 45 people but 200 pieces for each of those 45 um i hope it all i hope it all works out um yeah it's small you know the gamelin games that you see like the the tiny epic world uh they did their own tiny epic fantasy that also fits in this range um you might be able to use these components to play those games if you didn't uh, have it already or if you're playing it already if you had a cardboard version of it from the Tiny Epic series, uh, those are other things you could do, uh, stuff to think about uh, from this 3D printed world. If it's 3D printed, honestly though, it doesn't need to be in the tag uh, for it because the manufacturing process doesn't really matter to buyers unless you're going to offer STLs. So let's look real quick and see if they're gonna offer STLs. They are, okay. So you can print it off yourself. Um, are these all all over with, these other ones? So, eh, you're gonna expect to pay a lot of uh, money for filament in all the different colors. And you'd have to probably have both FDM and a resin printer. So it would be better to pay them to make the pieces I don't know. I still don't think that 3D printed necessarily needs to be here um, so much as a tactical modular uh, board game it would probably be better and bring in more people. But that's part, uh, you know, it's questionable. That part's questionable. A lot of German games this time. Brewmaster, but this is instead of being Irish or German Brewmaster, but it's made by Germans, is for Irish <laughs> folks. I don't know how those two cultures go together. Maybe they're just like, everybody loves a good beer. So let's just bring these two together. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, that makes some kind of sense. But when you think of shamrocks and stuff, you just don't automatically think of Germany. But when you think of beer, you probably do. Um, they do make a fine group. But, uh, you know, I prefer Guinness. So I, I drink mostly the Irish stuff. Uh, I like the ideas of having leprechauns uh, and brewmasters working together. Um, there's a lot of interesting things happening here. Uh, it has some uh, drinking game additions, such as the red cups. Although this comes from Europe, and I thought that the solo cups, the red solo cups, was an American exclusive thing. Um, if you follow like top tens or any of the other... I don't know. He's got Simon Whistler's got so many channels. He was talking about how certain Europeans will actually come here to America to get the red solo cups as a souvenir because they see it as such an American thing. So I don't know if they're available or are required for this. Um, game wise, not really seeing a whole lot of how to play it other than just reading a big thing. And if this is supposed to be a drinking game and it requires this much reading beforehand, I'm not sure it's going to be successful. I've yet to get anyone to sit through some rules for a game while they've been drinking. And $33,000, it needs to come down to about a fifth of that in order to be in the realistic range for um, this type of thing. But 
I think art wise it's kind of cute it's a neat little idea viticulture is a, a popular uh, board game uh, maybe it's just because that one's for the wine crowd but I think that if they're going to actually talk about the brewing process or creation process that there's a bit more space for for people to buy into it as long as they don't have to get drunk while playing um, there's a lot more people that would be open to playing then we have parents are human a bilingual game I'm not really sure how that translates but it doesn't sound like a game from the name or it sounds like something that would be a robot <laughs> um, instead it seems to be something about language and you can pick it up in English uh, in combination with Vietnamese, Spanish, Korean, or Tagalog. So, um, I mean, San Francisco is a very diverse area. So I, I could see how all of these um, Asian uh, cultures are in that same area. I live next to Long Beach and I mean Carson, where all of those cultures are also represented um having so many different editions though that's a lot of skews for a small game so that, that can be hard to produce um topics wise all right what was your favorite food growing up some form of mac and cheese what was your most important lessons you want to pass on to the next generation don't be a dumbass uh share or describe your favorite picture of each other I guess that's selfies. Take 10 minutes to write. Oh, no. Do not take 10 minutes to write a letter to each other, then exchange. Nobody's going to do that. They're going to hide that card. They're going to break. It's, no one wants to break the flow of conversation or game to walk out. Now you're creating homework. That's. Uh, you know what? You know what? I'm going to take that back. This is for Asian cultures, and Asian parents love giving their kids homework. So maybe that's why that's supposed to be be in there but like oh to everyone else that's terrible so maybe it's maybe it's more for a very select group of people in which case um maybe kickstarter is the right place to go maybe there's a different place uh to get more people into it i worry for them because they've just got so many skews sounds like they they spent a lot of money and maybe they have people that are involved in it that already translated the cards but um yeah i mean I, I maybe also this would be helpful for sending to uh vietnam um somewhere in south america korea or the philippines to help them learn english maybe that would be helpful here i know in korea like they would hand this out as homework no problem then coming out of raleigh north carolina where in North Carolina, they had a lot of pirates. Uh, sunken treasure, pillage and plunder card against adventure game. Uh, so water's nice. Well, how does the water work? You flip it over, and is it a memory game? Or are you just using like Battleship, where you're like trying to figure out what part of the grid? A little more explanation would be helpful. Uh, they do look pretty cool as far as the artwork goes. It's really easy to tell the aesthetic. It's just a little difficult to tell what gets you a score. Um, and I think that would get, if they had more information or some type of animated um, GIF or something that, or GIF, whatever you want to call it. GIF sounds like a peanut butter to me, whatever. Uh, then graphic, uh, something animated, it would be very helpful in understanding the fun of the game like where the mechanical fun is supposed to be but the art and all that looks like it would fit well for something you play with your kids uh it just needs to express what would be fun for the kids to play i mean i don't what's there's even more of these drinking games i guess during lockdown so many people have been drinking themselves silly that they think that they're gonna make a bunch of money in the game i'm gonna tell you guys right now people are gonna be trying to get sober <laughs> they're not gonna be trying to keep the the this this part going like they uh they, they're gonna want to dry out they want to feel better um there's no information as to how the game plays that's why it's at a dollar which is kind of like the minimum um 
So it says tailored to all types of drinkers. There should be a description of what those all types are. Um, because some people are like me and they just want to drink and talk and not play the game. You know, the game just gets in the way of them enjoying more booze. So uh, maybe they can find a way to throw some information down in a visual format that explains what their game is. And uh, that might help their, their process out quite a bit. Then we have a tabletop RPG, Delver Heroes of Farnwald. This didn't make it in the other RPG stuff because this one is a card game version. A competitive card game version. So uh, you can see it's got eight heroes. Uh, how the battlefield and tactics and treasures and all that. That's pretty standard for what you would find in these fantasy RPGs. You get the paladin and barbarian. Uh, I guess the alchemist would be your... And the warlock are your magic users. And the priest, of course, is your cleric. And they don't want to break it down to wizards. So I guess that's what keeps them from getting sued. Four to seven players, though. That's difficult. Uh, if you're going to have that many people around playing a fantasy game, they may just be playing D&D instead. So it's kind of hard to sell. Um on what that is all about. Putting everything into these quick videos, the supposedly quick videos, uh, it's a mistake because people are really precious about their time. And if it's just, if you're looking at it, it's like, oh, it's gonna be a video, how long is it? Oh, it's like half an hour, it's 45 minutes. Just get to the chase and tell me how the game plays. That's why I always recommend people put the graphics in is because sell them with the graphic and then maybe they'll click on the the how to play this or that but they may make the buying decision before they click on the how to play thing so just based on the art just based on like the look of the mechanics if they kind of get what's going on so uh you shoot yourself in the foot by just putting it into videos or, or putting into big blocks of text so if you're looking for another fantasy game maybe give this one a shot especially if you just want it to be in the card space and not so much about having all the the RP, the role play part of your RPG, as you would find in another type of tabletop game. Then we have a different type, Orc Tavern, 28 millimeter old school minis, and that tells you exactly what it is. So you have the boards, you have the minis, <laughs> tells you exactly what you're getting. Um, you have the acrylic standees if you wanted those instead. Um, they're what they're offering. They have metal models if you need them. Uh, what's special about the game, character descriptions, you try to get to it pretty quick, even though it's a lot of text, you do see some pictures now, uh, you know what I mean? Like, there's some idea right now how much you're getting for the money or how things could change, uh, what the different levels are, it's, it's pretty well spelled out there. And, uh, yeah, they're breaking out the stretch goals. It's a little early to think about how the stretch goals are, um... Especially when you haven't really gotten anyone in there. This has only been up for a couple hours on a holiday weekend. So I would expect that to maybe pick up uh, a little bit better. Um, where is it coming out of? Minneapolis. So I know some guys named Tony Chen. But I don't think it's the same guy. Uh, there are a lot of people named that. <laughs> um, this does suffer from the same type of thing. Where it's like show people playing it. But it does a really good job of explaining the pieces that you get with it so at least you have a more of a concept of how the game would play so uh like i said these are this was one of the last it's like second to last or third to last uh campaign to pop up for this three-day weekend that not a lot of people will be necessarily paying attention to so i think probably tuesday or wednesday if it doesn't get completely buried by other projects on tuesday uh that's when they'll see the money Timing, man, timing is a part of it, but it might still be a fun uh, tavern crawl kind of thing uh, for people to play. Then if you're into Alexander the Great, how about a game that's named after him? So you got a tabletop game here where you're looking at the strategies, not necessarily uh, in the same capacity as a war game would be, but you're going to be moving kind of in the footsteps and the board has these long descriptions about uh, what he did in those areas. Um, I don't know if a game 
bored is the best place for a history lesson. Uh, it's hard to read on the table. So I, I would say like cards or something or a book would probably be a better place to put all of that expositional information. But, you know, that's up to them. Uh, but running around in the shoes, playing what is essentially like Game of Life or Shoots and Ladders, that type of thing, just in a historical context, I don't think is that bad. Uh, it's an interesting way of teaching people, considering how much I've learned from playing video games that had a historical context. You know how much you probably picked up from Age of Empires 2? Just in the way people just... Domus! Like, whatever faction you played, all the different things that they uh, they would have, what they would say, uh, or when you played through one of their campaigns. You picked up a lot. I don't know if it'll like work on Jeopardy, but it's not a bad idea to teach people. Uh, some history stuff or some other context by gamifying it. And we have the return of the Oracle. We are into the RPG magazines and all that kind of fun stuff now. And this is 5e compatible, but you can use it just about everywhere. Like most of their um, their editions, they always have some fantastic artwork, some interesting ideas. This one seems to be based on maybe prophecy and psychic individuals, uh, different NPCs. Um, this is very much like the, the trees in Song of Ice and Fire in the north that were the old gods. Um, art, as you can see, is all looking pretty good. Game advice, magic items, um, different ways for travelers to use, uh, the secrets of magic, some 10 card tarot fun stuff. There's some tarot cards later in this episode that might be useful for that some more trinkets and that's always something that helps you customize a character or a treasure so if you've enjoyed any of the previous ones if you play any of these games Dungeons and dragons pathfinder 13th age pendragon rune quest tunnels and trolls and i'm sure many other types of these same fantasy games you might find some useful information in the oracle or one of the previous other uh magazines that you might be able to pick up in pdf form or subscribe yourself if you wanted to get those subscriptions. You can do it that way as well. Uh, yeah, you can check out the previous campaigns. They've got five other ones. And uh, just ask them and see if they've got copies of the other stuff that you might be able to add in one way or another. If uh, you enjoy the content and you, you want to check this one out. Then we have the D Sanction Adventures. And I believe the D Sanction has something to do with John D. Um, as it says here, an RPG of Elizabethan Investigation. John D was not the best person in the world, but he tried to be a, a supernatural investigator, an anti-witch person. Um, he may have caused more problems than he solved <laughs> in the end of reality, but that is an interesting place uh, to run an, an RPG from. So 36 pages in this book, uh, so it's not that expensive. You can get it for... Uh, 12 bucks for the PDF version and the soft core included. So not that expensive. The D sanction idea and time I think is ripe for the picking. Maybe you can include it with some Solomon Cain kind of world to throw in there. Uh, yeah, but, uh, five full adventures to be able to play in this space. It sounds like there's enough to keep you going pique your interest and uh satisfy you in a uh, you know elizabethan variety and then for whatever you want to play use it for it looks like it would be great for halloween we have the war for sitanen upon the isa sea this is 300 3d printable parts for a 32 millimeter scale uh just whatever you need you want pirates you got pirates uh, you need a specific character that you can't build otherwise and you just want to use specific parts, then it breaks it down. 17 torsos, 14 pairs of legs, 17 styles of arms, tails, wings, whatever it is you're looking for. 42 separate heads. You can make whatever it is that you think you need. Um, you can see there's lots of different species, tabaxi even, uh, pumpkin heads <laughs> for... Uh, your um, your October adventures, you have uh, possibly some ghouls, possibly some dragonkin, or um, various uh, 
I can't pronounce. I keep wanting to say Tiamat, but Tiefling, Tieflings, with the horns. Uh, it looks like from Rick and Morty, Mr. Poopy Buttholes even arrived. Um, but the the style of dress is definitely more of that seafarer style. Uh, a couple of corsets and things might work well for uh, tavern people. Uh, not a lot of female um, legs. Obviously, some bulges and things wouldn't necessarily always be there for the females. I don't know. I'm not going to judge. Whatever. Um, but uh, if they had dresses or things like that as well, um, that would be cool. Maybe that's something that could pop up in the uh, stretch goals. They could be used as kilts, that kind of thing. But you got your various uh, bases. They didn't skimp out on those. So the wooden boards of which you'd find on deck or the sandy you know shores of wherever you're going Some different personalities you can come up with with the poses so i think it's pretty useful um especially if you like mixing and matching and all that resin printer is going to be required because of the detail but you can print off a whole bunch of them you can make armies you can make whatever you need you can make a whole uh town whole army whatever it is that you think you need I don't know which game has half beholders, but, you know, they got that going on as well. So, uh, some monsters even to throw in. Um, a bunch of crabs. Crabs can be spooky. Uh, some little ones, some big ones, that kind of stuff. So, uh, some descriptions of the, the, the factions here. You can ignore, or use, whatever you want to do. Um, I think it's a useful grouping if you want to do your own building and you want to do your own... Uh, customization dioramas that kind of stuff also for your 3d printer but this one is meant to be a fantasy skirmish game i think you could use it uh for the eagle fight at the end of lord of the rings um i mean if you wanted to flip the perspective for of mice and mystics then you could do that here uh, i think they're really cool looking they have the neat stands that uh, give it that sense of flight you have some terrestrial individuals, um, Golden Compass style, with the uh, bear riders. Um, you have the elk or moose. I think those are caribou uh, riders. Um, and yeah, look at that. So lots of cool different uh, animals and things that they might want to uh, be mounted on and fly with. Even if you didn't play the game, there's some remarkable pieces here that might inspire you for uh, hundreds of other games. And it's a cool looking artwork to go along with it. So ideas are abound uh, price wise, 35 bucks to get the STLs. So uh, $70 for some extra stuff and to start getting the stretch goals and that kind of thing. Um, but just basic, jump in, use your resin printer, play the game. 35 bucks for the rules not that bad a commitment we've talked a lot about fantasy but maybe fantasy is not your thing maybe you like mechs the viper suit rebel minis digital direct 28 millimeter and 15 millimeter uh figures i'm gonna guess that the little guy down here is 15 millimeters um that's tiny super tiny so that would be like a quarter of the scale of your regular minis but that means that your mechs would fit well onto the board. So make those decisions as you will. Uh, what's the deal here? Uh, I'm going to guess you have to figure out your own LED systems. Uh, because these guys are kind of tiny to fit batteries into. But what all this crazy pictures and things that they've got. Um, this Anycubic, they have a new uh, printer that I have called the Viper. If you're going to go out and buy an FDM printer, go get yourself the Viper because it has auto leveling and the damn thing's a tank. I've only had one thing that stopped it and took me a little while to fix, but I was able to fix it. No problem. Um, but that thing just prints reliably constantly. So I like that. Elegoo Saturn is a bigger version. They're coming out with a Jupiter soon. So if you're going to make like giant big old mechs and stuff like that and some suggestions on different mechanics and all that kind of business um then maybe you'll you'll add on those magnets they suggest uh but that part's up to you 
play whatever skirmish game, play whatever uh, RPG you like, and have these Ed 209 looking dudes with their Gatling guns blow stuff up. Then we always have dice. Here, we, these ones are metal. I like these ones because they're high contrast though. As you can see, you can read all those numbers. Except that this weird gunmetal went off to the left. But uh, for the most part, let's see if they get more pictures. Uh, they're pretty high contrast, even the ones that have like lots of swirls of color and different things. It doesn't seem to get in the way. It has some nice little accenting uh, on the corners, but it doesn't defeat the purpose of it being readable. So I like all that kind of stuff. Metal dice are expensive. No one's going to tell you they're not. Um, you can see like the, the rewards and the dollar amounts, like <laughs> the t-shirts the and things are first, right? So, uh, one set of metal dice, $32, whereas more normally you pay like $10 maybe for some regular old acrylic ones. Um, yeah, it gets a little bit better if you move up. Uh, and the pricing, you can get some bigger ones and that kind of stuff that might help too. I always provide the warning though, if you're going to buy any of this metal stuff, you're going to break things in your house. You're going to get chips in your tables, especially if they're sharp edges like this. Uh, so just be aware. Um, use a cup, use something else, a uh, dice tower. Um, don't, don't just chuck the dice around and try not to step on them because you're going to break a toe or some other part of your foot because uh, this metal is much more dense <laughs> than your foot, which makes it uh, easier to break your bone than it is to, to break the other stuff. So they've also entered into the hex vaults um, with all the other folks. So if you wanted to pick up some additional pieces to go along with that, maybe you could keep it all in these hex vaults instead of on the floor, ready to stab you like a Lego. Um, just seems to be the season for all that. And there are lots of things about 5e that make it nice and streamlined and one of those things is not having certain rules for everything in which case other folks need to come in and create better systems this is caravans for stuff to run camps so you're gonna have to deal with morale you're gonna have to deal with weird events that could happen while you're out camping or maybe you're in the middle of uh an oregon trail style adventure you get all these events that could happen in your resource management whatever that may depend on um if all the horses died because they got sick or whatever the case is then uh you might need to keep that part in mind just like you would for those old games if you want to give this a shot check it out from dead channel studios uh i'm not really seeing descriptions of what the rules are uh you can kind of go through and use this graphic <laughs> um to get an idea of what's going on it does further complicate things. Typically on a regular D&D book, you might just get a random encounter set by a time interval um, on a table. And, uh, you know, it's all right. I mean, if you're running eight hours in the woods, what's the chance of coming up on a frost giant? You know, that's basically what you get from before. Now you got to kind of really think about the aspects of your management of your space of the things that you have on you that could add also some horror elements if you're out doing the the mist wandering in ben richton or you're doing icewind dale and you're out there in the blizzards this could expand on um the scarcity aspects different things that you may have or things that could get stolen that kind of stuff uh, so there's ways to use this kind of information to increase the fun oh and just like the oracle we're going to add another one of these zines that pops up a lot this time. Creature Feature Quarterly. It doesn't even feel like a quarter's gone by since we saw the last one. Uh, some big old headed monsters, but it comes with uh, all the stuff you would need for um, your old school encounters. Uh, paper minis you can print out and VTT tokens that you can pop into Roll20 or whatever you want to. It's a zine. It's got all the monsters and things on them. You can buy the previous copies. Uh, they're they're not necessarily hard to re uh, re to recreate to reproduce. Chronocrat, there in the middle, looks like the guy that we're talking about this time. 
So if you're interested in a chronocrat, lore, adventure seeds, this time you get 16 monsters to go with it. Um, yeah, it's interesting ideas. Throw them all in there. For all the beer and uh, pretzel kind of gamers that are playing the old school stuff that don't want to get bogged down by all the new things. Speaking of new things, maybe you got a new campaign, a new player you don't know what to do with. You could go on a hunt for a sword named Goblin Grief in 5e. And that's what this is. An adventure to first to third level uh, people. If you've already been through Fandelver, uh, if you wanted to start over, you don't know where to go from. Then you got to get one of these types of uh, early campaigns that uh, has a small amount of sessions that lets you get to the end pretty quickly so you don't have such a crazy amount of commitment this would be something great in between campaigns if you're waiting on somebody to have a, a change in life uh, be completed and then you can go back to having your regular game that's a good time to use these type of smaller campaigns um, yeah I mean goblin grief as a sword doesn't sound all that different than sting from the hobbit something that will let you know when uh, the baddies are around. And you can see other cool things that they've created. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how much time it would take or how many adventures are in here. That would be fun information to get. But uh, I'm just saying, in general, these are really useful to have if you haven't made your own um, and you just want to try something different. Or you want to veg out if you're the always DM or if you're the never DM and you want to give something a first... Uh, crack and like I said you've already played through the stuff that Dungeons and Dragons themselves have provided then uh, these early adventures um, are great for you know a couple of sessions that uh, let you play with the goblins or whatever other crazy things that are in there that you probably have a bunch of minis for from other games so it shouldn't uh, be too overcomplicated for you to make it work whatever your play style is and here we have more wood stuff um, competing with wormwood uh but wormwood for these uh more uh they call them vaults uh the next thing they come out with is a deck vault uh they've already come out with these hero vaults they've already come out with hexy time which is currently running and all that kind of stuff so now would be a good time to come out with these other pieces I don't know what the lumber market prices are at right now. <laughs> they were up 400%, so that would be a, uh, a hope that they've come down uh, to make this work. Uh, but you can get all these different inlays, colors, all that kind of stuff, different clasps, uh, and a different feel from the Wormwood stuff. I keep mentioning Wormwood because they are the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Um, $45 here for uh, a dice and miniature case. $100 uh, to get multiple cases. So these things are not cheap. Uh, they might be worth it, though, because of the amount of uh, engraving and extra work that goes along with it, and depending on the wood that you like. But these are competitive price-wise with the Wormwood ones. Um, so, yeah. That's why you compare them. And Athens, Ohio... Uh, they may even have some of the same types of designers and equipment and builders and all that kind of stuff that go along with it. It ain't cheap. Uh, if, if this is super successful, maybe they'll come back around with, a, with another one next year. And I am hoping by next year all of these supply problems will be sorted out. Maybe things will actually even come down in price a little bit. Space Dwarfs. These are really popular. Uh, popular but I, I'm saying is they have lots of competitors <laughs> also making other types of space dwarfs. So whatever Starfinder's got going on, I think Starfinder just came out with a new beginner's box. Uh, this might be the right time to start packing up uh, other types of equipment that you can play. Now, if you want to use these guys in Zombicide um, Invader, that'd be a good thing to use. Warhammer, of course, whatever you want. Uh, there's lots of different weapons and things that you can pose them with and, and make other things happen. Uh, whatever type of squad you need. Uh, I know Kill Squad, I think, changed some rules. And you might need some new figures uh, for that. So these might be a good time 
to pick some of these fellas up if you wanted to have a dwarf team squad war army whatever uh you can swap them around and may the mohawk be with you and all that kind of cool stuff so something to think about you got medics you got the wounded you got casualties it's pretty complete and you can get it in stl and print them off yourself as you want so something else to think about when uh, you would otherwise be paying lots of money for licensing markups and then we have stars without number rpg offset print edition i know this had come out maybe a year ago maybe a year and a half ago and it did pretty well hundred thousand dollars nothing to shake a stick at also so um yeah nice artwork I remember mentioning that so that part looks like alien the above one looked like pandora so you can get to a lot of the uh sci-fi adventure types that maybe you have been a fan of for a while uh they have um it looks like another game called wolves of god that might fit also within this system but be a dark ages pre-medieval version um that goes along with it so if you want your rpgs to have incredibly varied alien worlds to adventure inside of then uh, maybe this is a good time for you to jump onto it it looks like it is yeah a revised edition revised in 2017 maybe that's the last time I saw it <laughs> was 2017 I've been making a lot of these videos uh, but I remember it popping up it's uh, yeah it's just a, a bunch of new interesting tools for you to be able to run your RPGs out in space and have something maybe like No Man's Sky. Maybe that's the best way uh, to create comparison. I do not know how this got into the RPG side. Mint Mini, dice drafting game. Uh, I put these all in a list and I just plow forward. It's all in the same episode, so take it as you want. Uh, if you want a drafting game that fits in a mint tin, then uh, Poketo has you covered. Uh, last time Paqueto put something out, somebody left a comment saying that they hadn't gotten their last thing that Paqueto had, had offered. But here's the thing. It was before the deadline. They were already complaining about it. So um, I, I don't consider that much to worry about necessarily. There's a lot of uh, delays and things going on right now. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I know if there's an unhappy viewer with their stuff maybe they don't want to recommend it uh, i hope they got their stuff already um but i think we're allowed to be a little extra patient uh be or required to be a little extra patient just because there's so much uncertainty in the shipping market not having anything to do with what any manufacturer or any game designer could have any effect on um that's just the world. I mean, the world's different today than it was three years ago. So uh, I wouldn't blame Paqueto for for shipping woes. Um, but yeah, if you like these mint tin style things that you can take to the break room and uh, play a game and you can you have heroic feats and villains and all this com uh, kind of stuff in a complete game that you can play during your lunch uh, period in these eight mini games... I think you get what you pay for. All right, back to RPGs. Ankur, Kingdom of the Gods, uh, second edition. And, I mean, doesn't that look like a Twi'lek? Of course it looks like a Twi'lek, but it has nothing to do with it. D12 system, and they say they have realistic, gritty combat. Uh, fine. Rules light system for indie sci-fi playing. The setting is based on Sumerian myths, which I guess is Gilgamesh. Uh, that being almost all of what we know <laughs> about that time. So, yeah. Uh, you can download a character sheet if you wanted to look at it. I would say maybe as well a little bit of fifth element thrown in. So, that's cool. Second edition, though. Means it's been through some testing and found some things that uh, people hopefully will like better. Uh, made some changes and inclusions, all that kind of fun business. 
it's almost funded and uh yeah i mean i see space guns and ancient egypt that's not sumeria but maybe it's close enough then we have not transformers but armor for your animals uh in an anachronistic time system um all of these types of animals, I believe, except the crocodile. I don't know how you get armor on a crocodile. They're born with it. They're built in. And they do whatever the hell they want. You're not going to control it. But uh, when it came to, like, a mammoth, uh, an elephant, or maybe even a bear or some type of wolf, uh, I could see somebody having used them in combat. Um, but not made with these straight lines and all that kind of stuff. So that part, I would say, is a futuristic version um, you have the basilisk, which is what I refer to as the crocodile, uh, elephant, bears, and boars. And yeah, they've been beasts of burden and they've been beasts of war. So if you want them for your group, you can enjoy the fun there. Um, the basilisk, as they refer to it. The, the land croc looks a little bit like an ankylosaur with the uh, club-like tail that they've added to the end of it. So uh, maybe it's like a 10,000 BC, 1 million BC future world. Sorry, not 1 million BC, 1 million AD future world where we've brought back these ancient beings to compete in arena combat. That might be a fun game for these. Then we have a tabletop RPG in the Powered by the Apocalypse system, but this is nothing that would feel like it needed an apocalypse. Briar and Bramble is about the yard. Um, you have a wild world uh, and a community of critters, and everyone plays their part. So you have the little dogs, and you have the little rodents, and you have the, the raccoons, and the mushrooms, and the acorns, and everybody just kind of living their, their best life uh, the way they have for bajillions of years. And uh, it's, it's a happy place. Uh, it uses um, all the different things that you would normally expect, like X-Card, but um, it uh, is basically just... Uh, a fun, friendly, good time of role playing in the English countryside. So, if you want to get your Winnie the Pooh on, I, I think this probably is your best way of doing that. Alternatively, perhaps you're looking for uh, a horror gothic setting for characters levels 1 to 10, which is typically where most campaigns end. In this case, you have the Council of Bones. So, a uh, very comic book style in the way that it's being presented, but it is for 5e. And, uh, yeah, you know, all that uh, Victorian era gothic world of uh, intrigue and rich people and the terrible things that they do to each other out in an old asylum. And you got headless horsemen, you got scarecrows. Uh, so maybe this is a mind flayer or some other type of uh, cephalopod walking around. And uh, yeah, if any of that sounds familiar, if any of that sounds good, you're going to be getting about uh, around 200 pages worth of, uh, of goodies. Most of it's going to be in black and white for the artwork. But that's not the end of the world. Lots of our most favorite uh, RPG adventures have been in black and white then maybe give this a shot and check out what types of horror is going to be involved. Keeping in mind, we have other horror source books out there right now, like Van Richten's Guide, and uh, you can mix and match a lot of the themes to make things your own, and uh, maybe give this one a shot from the Council of Bones. Same kind of horror setting. It is Halloween popping up after, soon after all. Gravemire is about the Gilded Age in Louisiana, out there in the bayou. Maybe you can eat yourself some crawdad. Maybe you can eat yourself some uh, some gator. Whatever you want. You can talk uh, to each other like you're... Uh, oh, man. Who's the the political commentator? He's on everything. And he called him the Raging Cajun. And I, it's so late. I forgot his name. But I love that guy. Uh, his name will come to me. He's married to a uh, 
a right-wing individual and he's a, a very famous left-wing individual starting from the Bill Clinton era. He was a consultant on there. And I'm, I'm thinking James Crawfish, but his name's not James Crawfish, but I bet you he's had a crawfish. Uh, he's a big fan of Ole Miss. You know everything about him. When you get old and you just can't remember the names of people anymore, and, uh, you know, it's just like, God, it's right there. I can. He's bald. You know what I mean? He's a, he's a, he's a very thin guy. You can think everything about him. If you, if you heard his name, you'd be like, that guy. You know who I'm talking about. I'm describing him perfectly. So, anyway, uh, you can talk to each other like him. <laughs> so, this is an original system. Uh, so, they say with two 12-sided dice. Um, uh, didn't they say this was supposed to be for 5e? No, it's not. It's, it's not for 5e. It, like, say, they say it's this original system with two D12s. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of cool things. Uh, you can have a Lugaru. You can have all different things from, from French folklore thrown in there as well because it fits uh, really well. Uh, 150 pages. I think Gravemire could be a great way to explore uh, a new system uh, this is be popping out in February, but if it was available for Halloween, I'd be like, man, that'd be awesome. But uh, I think exploration of some stuff that you might include in other Lovecraftian terms would be uh, really well done here. Other stuff, uh, you know, just exploring different places. One of, speaking of Lugaru, one of the Arkham Horror Living Card game uh campaigns the there's a special side quest uh, that happens to take place in this type of a of a world out in the swamps and uh, if you wanted to expand past that this would be a great way to get started uh, a very underutilized part of the world and time frame for rpgs i think even adding in something like uh, world of darkness would be a natural fit if you like some of the ideas here so yeah uh, I think it's a good start. And the food would be fantastic. James Carville, the name finally came to me. We got a nuclear reactor for your sci-fi sets. 3D printable uh, doodads and griblies and all that kind of stuff. You could use uh, a lot of these components to uh, be scatter terrain for other pieces. You can uh, hook it up to your spaceships and other stuff. These little reactor pieces and all that kind of fun goodness. Um, it would fit really well. Uh, I don't know if this belt would be in this area, but <laughs> it seems like a, a serious point of failure. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know something that could be very useful depending on what you're trying to create. Um, even if you're trying to make this look like a turbine of some variety or an exhaust port uh, for an engine, uh, there's lots of cool things here that if you didn't even want to use it as a as a nuclear uh, device. All of this stuff that you can print out that will go to create it is uh, pretty amazing uh, and useful to create for other things, especially since it's 3D printable. Then you can set up your resin printer to uh, to just put up a bunch of valves or other things you can use in, in any sci-fi uh, setting, pretty much. I have way too many paints for this to work, but if you do not have hundreds of paints uh, and brushes and just crap sitting around. I think it might be fun to take something like this with you to the uh, hobby shop and get a little contest going. You got your wet palette, you got your, your paints, you got your brushes and all that kind of stuff in this Paint Pal hobby travel system. Um, or if you knew you were just going to work on a certain um, section, then you could do it. Uh, this here is a 15 pound, sorry, 15 euro. $18 uh, STL file that uh, could be pretty useful. So you get a lot of cool things. I mean, you got storage for your Citadel paints, you got storage for your Army Painter paints or Vallejo, whatever you're going to get in your drop bottles. Then, uh, yeah, I think uh, that part's pretty cool. And you might be able to mix and match and add a few things here and there. Uh, you got yourself your pin vise, you got your, your brushes, you got all kinds of neat things. So, um, I say, uh, you know, if you got the, the 3d printer, this would not be your least useful tool. Uh, you can even expand it. 
if you have a little bit uh, bigger bed size, then you might be able to change things up just a little bit and uh, make a bigger one. Or if you had to, you might be able to shrink it down slightly, just depending on what you need. And we all know you get this pet creep that happens in your RPGs and uh, maybe you want to, I don't know, uh, push into that further and have your dice carried around in a pet carrier. So if you have the personality that you must have all the pets and you must make all of the animals tame and be friends with all the other things, then maybe the joke of this would be fun for that. Um, yeah, that's, that's who I think this would be best for. But you can pick whatever you want. It's just a neat little pet carrier. Maybe you just happen to have a, a ton of pets and uh, you want to show that part of your personality. So you uh, print this out for yourself. I think it could be interesting. Give it a shot. I mean, if, you, if it looks cute to you, then just get it. But maybe you need something that's a little more uh, reversible or bag-like <laughs> than uh, you have these pouches of potential instead of uh, bags of holding. And, uh, you know, they look neat. If you like them, then you can get them. There are lots of companies that come out with these types of bags. These are not the first ones. Um, you can add some things like a stress ball in the shape of a D20. Um, yeah, if you're getting stress from your gaming, then, then maybe that's especially useful. Dice trays, towers that fold out, little leather pieces. The ubiquitous um, <laughs> dice vaults in the hex with the magnets. These ones are more expensive than the... Uh, ones from Wormwood, so just keep that in mind, which ones you wanted to get, and uh, maybe you want something else with some felt linings and some different dice and that kind of business. So these folks at Geek Therapeutics, $70 for dice, uh, seem to be on the rather high end of uh, the price index, but you know, if that's where you're, you're at, um, then more power to you, lots of different types see how it compares to other dice that's out there on the market yeah there's a lot of stuff going on straight out of fort worth texas uh you know you could look at black oak studio and much other people and uh, see how it all compares price wise and maybe you like these pictures better then we have rain and blood which is um I, it's supposed to be some type of pun maybe but the spelling of rain i guess is for somebody's name but the word itself is a scottish song i think a uh a very unused one anymore uh word for it but it's for mothership which is a sci-fi game uh so yeah if you are into it i think mothership is the one that plays like alien where there's always some type of beast on the ship itself and you're you're always having to f try to either escape it or destroy the ship that kind of thing 60 full color pages uh it looks pretty neat a more bloody version um of a sci-fi game than you typically would expect so yeah something worth checking out um sci-fi horror on a spaceship space cults pirates people stealing things whatever genetic vampire is sounds good to you play it and speaking of making decisions you can decide what you want to pay here for this character somebody just decided that uh they wanted to put it out and see what people thought uh it looks very draconic could be a dragon kin but um yeah you just you know give them an idea uh calling it stl and the stl is the name of the company i think might confuse some people so good luck to them with that um but, you know, if nobody else had taken it, then maybe every time somebody goes and looks for STL files, then they'll pop up first. Maybe that's part of the marketing idea. We'll see where it goes. See if there's uh, enough people out there willing to pay that kind of money. Looks like they're paying about two and a half dollars a piece on average. So they need another two or three hundred people that like it in order to get it. So there you go. From one euro, there you get to start it. And we have more for the Dungeon Crawl Classic crowd. You don't get anything more classic than the Labyrinth as a Dungeon Crawl. And we have Aeon Ancient Greece Volume 1. So it is a magazine built to be played with Dungeon Crawl Classics. And you get to play through the Labyrinth of Daedalus. 
that's the most classic. It's the number one. So zero level people uh, with a hundred ancient Greek names. So now when it says here Minoan uh, and these other uh, ancient languages, some of these ancient languages we have no idea about. I think Minoan was one of them. Um, the later cultures I think we picked up. And then there's several Minoan alphabets uh, that were swirling around at the time. It's one of the earliest alphabets we know about, but we have no idea what any of the words mean. So just something to think about. Ancient Greece. It's cool. Sharktopus. Give Roger Corman his money for the name. Staying in Greece, but this time being produced there. Custom bestiary. So they're selling, I guess, pictures of animals. And then you can decide what you want it to be. I mean, Cerberus is pretty easy to figure out. And like which one he is some type of lion and a dragon uh medusa so it looks like they're they're classic creatures um thing being they're classic creatures from mainly greek sources so if you wanted that in part of your game or you want the exercise of trying to create backstories for uh these kinds of things then maybe this will work for you and then we have a tarot deck. Uh, I know in Dungeons & Dragons there's Taraka from uh, Curse of Strahd that gets utilized uh, a lot. Um, it says here these are inspired by the sun and moon and then compatible with D&D. I mean, uh, you can call it a Taraka deck, but if it's got the major arcana, then it's just a tarot deck. Uh, I don't know necessarily how it's supposed to be compatible with D&D, but uh, because it throws itself in there, I guess I figured I'd include it. And you can make the decision on whether or not it works for you. Um, just like anything else, if you like the art, then you pick it up. But it's a tarot card set, and you know that, that part's just up to you. What, what you do or don't believe or want to do with them. And another 5e adventure. This one is 20 adventures for Ravenloft. So if you did pick up the Taraka deck, then maybe use it here. Journey into Borka. Um, not a lot of description as to... Uh, what it is uh, supposed to be uh, taking you from levels 1 to 20. I would say you need Van Richten's Guide most likely or Curse of Strahd at a minimum to understand Ravenloft and what to create and the different factions and things there. But if you wanted to expand your adventures in the mists, then maybe give this a shot. Following in that same vein, Curse of Bloodstone Isle. Um, this was made by Mark Renhagen, and he says that he is the creator of Vampire. I'm not sure if that's Vampire the Masquerade, but it says here he worked as a co-founder of White Wolf uh, and a board member of Wizards of the Coast. So it's a good pedigree to start with. Um, Vampire the Masquerade, Chronicles of Darkness, World of Darkness has some of the most entertaining pieces of content and uh, like the, the different um, sects, the different types of uh, vampire clans that are out there is absolute genius. I don't know how much of them were his, but uh, if you've got that kind of pedigree, then that's a good start. So uh, you can see some really cool artwork, um, all this horror kind of stuff, different vamps and all that kind of business. Uh, yeah, and having the uh, clans of vampires and monsters and all that that happened in the World of Darkness is something that I wish could translate over here into D&D. &D. Um, slods have a little bit of that. Grung have a little bit of that. But not really like uh, societies of individual monsters. So uh, that would be cool if they could bring all that together. Uh, lots of people with interesting hair, um, and a, one guy with none, making a, a crazy, dark, interesting world for you to enjoy, uh, with a free preview in the Curse of Bloodstone Isle. So, why not give it a go? Uh, I mean, the, the guys that are behind Tanaris and all that other stuff, um, they don't have as much of a pedigree. There's, there, I mean, yeah, it's the designer of Skyrim and all this other stuff, but if this guy made Vampire, then he's just as high up there as those, those folks. 
Last week, if you didn't get enough pay what you want houses for the medieval worlds, here is another one, a nice little cottage. And uh, you can go back and check the stuff from last week. We had a few of them uh, on the, the episode. And maybe you can make yourself a nice little village to cobble them all together for some very, very low prices. Then we have Driven Into Darkness. This is a tabletop RPG with simultaneous action resolution. So um, Professor Dungeon Master and some other folks have come up with ways to use it in D&D, that same idea, just to speed up combat. And the idea uh, making it less turn-based, whereas like I do a thing, then you do a thing, but everybody instead would make all of their intentions happen and that's what would determine your placement and missing and all that um you keeping in mind you only get six seconds within a round of DD. so uh other things like palladium it's like 10 or 15 seconds uh you could react in different ways but in DD, in that six seconds you're pretty much committed to moving your body in a certain vector and it would take an additional amount of time to change that so it kind of makes sense to have a simultaneous system um, a lot of this description of play is just it's a big chunk of text. Uh, I wish you would break that up into something a little more easier to, to, to digest at a time. Um, I guess game sessions in this one are done by years instead of uh, sessions. I'm not really sure how that part would break down. Um, different systems for experience. Yeah, it sounds like more like a kingdom death. A hunt than it is what we would normally think of as an RPG if uh, if all that does come out true um, meaningful resource management and all that kind of stuff would be very kingdom death oriented so maybe this would be something that fits that uh, that kind of world procedural exploration solo or co-op maybe maybe and you get some paper pieces to go along with it um, yeah, I say give it a quick look, especially if you've been looking for a way to play on your own. And then we have yet another set of boxes, dice boxes. One picture of a dice box that's not even complete, competing with all these other wonderful ones. And I'm not saying, you know, Ashley P. isn't going to work hard on it. Uh, what I'm saying is we need to see the whole product you got to work on your your page there and that is finally it they're all done i will now render this out if you can like share and subscribe to support the channel if you like being kept up to date i know it's a lot of stuff and i'm the one that has to sit here <laughs> compile it through the week and then finally talk about it that's a lot you guys just have to skip through it if you don't like it and then go on to the next deal um it can, uh, you know, I, I, I know they're long episodes. I don't know if you guys like them long or, or not, it, but, uh, you know, I'm doing my best on it. What else I'm going to do my best on is to try to enjoy this three-day weekend we have here in America. I'm going to probably get a breakfast burrito at some point and throw a lot of spicy salsa on top of it and do a lot of napping. And I wanted to play more games, but I keep ending up painting more of the zombicide stuff. It's just that these episodes are so long that it's kind of pointless to try to include anything else at the end of them. Uh, if we get it around to it, uh, I can shut up and uh, make the system work a little better than maybe uh, I'll find the ability to throw those in, but you can check them out always. As I make them on the Instagram, the links are always in the description, so you can check that part out. I hope you guys have a wonderful one. Enjoy yourselves. Football starts next week, I think. Um, Cam Newton, you should have got yourself vaccinated. You'd have a job, man. No poke, go broke. That's what happens. Everybody else, hope you're all taking care. and Keep yourself together. My dad's doing a lot better, but he'd be doing even better had he got vaccinated. And uh, then he probably wouldn't be in the hospital now. Going on week three. So probably another month in there. It's, uh, it's no joke. So be careful, be safe, and hope all of your family is well uh, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. See you on Tuesday.